and happy for a long time, is thinking about um, the whole process of thinking about the origins of a country. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Scotland. Um, it's the, the easiest way, the natural way to do it is of course you think of the country today as some objective reality and then you're trying to trace it back to when you can begin to recognise that happening. Um, what we're going to do uh, today though is to just have a bit of a deeper look at that process and what this um, means for us as historians or people uh, interested in history. So, um, now what I'm going to start off with very quickly is, shall we say, the 20th century textbook view of the beginnings of Scotland. And uh, so you must tell me if uh, this, this rings any bells. I'm assuming it does. So well, if you groan and sort of say, oh God, no, we know that's not that, then uh, that would be very reassuring actually. So, uh, so here we are. So the story usually begins, you see, in 843 with Kenneth MacAlpin uniting as King of the Scots, uniting the Scots and picks to create a new kingdom called Arba. And then uh, the next big one, so it's all about territorial expansion, you see, and then the next bit is Battle of Carrum, 1018, and uh, that means that Lothian is fully integrated, and as it happens, the King of Sir Clyde dies, and then the future Duncan the I of Ulliba of Scotland becomes King of Sir Clyde, and all becomes united. We won't have time to talk about this, but just to tell you that that is very problematic. Um, if you want to, you can ask me about it later. Um, and then, of course, the bit that you're much more familiar with, I'm sure, uh, which is uh, the final bits of the territorial expansion, 1266, Treaty of Perth, uh, when the Western Isles becomes part of Scotland, and then 1468 to 9, when this part of the world becomes part of the Scottish Kingdom. We'll see more about that uh, later on. So. Um, that's, that's the textbook view. Um, do you recognise it? Mm -hmm. You do. Marvellous. Um, okay. Now, and of course, the Vikings play a big part in it all. Um, because, oops, lady, um, if we just go back to the beginning, you know, obviously the Vikings are meant to be the people behind this, uh, you know, causing devastation and therefore encouraging the Scots and Picts to get together. And uh, they're behind this eventually. Um, Carlin, let's not forget, 1018, uh, the King of Denmark is now King of England at this point, Canute, and uh, we need to say more about the obvious Norse aspect of 1266 and 1468 to 9. Now, interestingly, from a Scottish point of view, um, people tend to gravitate towards uh, 843, and, uh, and that's rather than insist that we should wait until 1468 and 1469 before we can say that's it, we've arrived at Scotland. Um, but actually it's not so unnatural to focus at the earliest possible time you think you possibly can, it doesn't matter what country you're talking about, people naturally say right our beginnings, let's go for as early as we can, when we can begin to see something that we can recognise as what we are today. Uh, so that's fine, however it's really does carry a serious risk of anachronism. That shouldn't come as too much of a surprise, very obviously. There is a bit of an issue um, assuming, somehow you've got this story and you're implicitly assuming that these people back in 843 or whenever it is, thought they were at the beginning of a story. Of course they had no idea whatsoever that that's what was happening, um, totally retrospective. That's very obvious, but what is not so obvious is the extent to which our conceptions, our modern conceptions of Scotland in this case, and the Scots, influence the way we actually think about the 9th century. So I'll just do this quickly, um, because what happens if you look at the contemporary sources of the time, well you discover nothing happened in 843 that was worth recording, um, and it doesn't matter where you shift your focus, there's no sign of the union of the Picts and Scots until you get to a king list from the reign of Alexander II, so that's 1214 to 49. So you've got to wait a terribly long time before people are starting to think in those terms, and then of course it gets repeated uh, thereafter, because it's very appealing. Um, and let's dive into the sources from that were actually written in the 9th century, and what you discover is that 
there's Kenneth MacAlpin and his brother and sons, and they're actually called, let's do it in English, King of the Picts. And, uh, and then you've got to get to the couple of generations later before you get them called King of Scotland, the Alaban. Uh, so that should be a moment to pause. So we've actually got Kenneth MacAlpin, brother and sons, as Kings of the Picts, the inhabitants are referred to as Picts. No sign at all then of this new kingdom, etc. It's just the old one um, under new management. Uh, moreover, um, this is absolutely fascinating, but I'm just going to tiptoe across it very quickly because it is a, a bit of imagined ancient history that was created in the reign of Constantine, son of Kenneth MacAlpin, um, 862 to 76. And what was being imagined was that Pickland had been a single entity, territorial entity, from Caithness all the way back to Fife, from the most ancient times. Indeed, from the beginnings of Pictish history, where you've got Cruthne, the Gaelic term of Picts. Mr. Cruthne, Mr. Pict, begins it all. So that sense of Pictland, not Pictland plus Scots and all the rest of it, Pictland and the Picts, that sense of it being actually enhanced as an ancient entity that's been a uni unitary territory from the beginning, actually can be dated to the reign of Kenneth MacAlpin's son, Constantine. So it all looks a little weird. And moreover, even earlier still, we've got this reference, it's a Gallic quote, but you've got Alaba plainly meaning Pitland. So the whole thing is much more complicated. Um, and you might wonder why historians, uh, 20th century historians generally, the people who wrote the textbooks we're familiar with, didn't do more with this. I mean, they must have known. And I find this fascinating because none of them were stupid people, of course. They were all scholars. And basically what's happened is that they've taken, they've absorbed our sense of what the Scuda Scots are and without question, without thinking about it. Uh, we all do this. Um, in various ways. Um, the idea of Scots, who are the Scots, is itself problematic. So if we go back to the 12th century, you're into this situation where the kingdom itself actually consists of a number of, let's call them countries, of which Scotland is that wee bit there, and therefore the Scots usually in the 12th century refers to those people, not the whole people of the kingdom. So that this basic idea of being Scottish, being equated with being subject to the King of Scots and everybody in the kingdom is <coughs> Scots, that is actually not there in the 12th century. It only comes into view in the 13th. Moreover, um, if we go back to the 9th century, um, I mean, the you know, John Bannerman, my teacher, uh, was very keen on the idea that the Dorian were the Scots. And therefore, Scottish history started when Fergus Moore crossed on his boat from County Antrim and set, in, set up shop in uh, Donad or whatever. Um, and I'm afraid this is all, um, well, imaginary. I mean, so much is imaginary that's nice and interesting. But this is, um, it doesn't work. Um, and for example, just to say these people are the Scots, well, okay, they will be referred to in Latin as Scoti, but Scoti means something completely different. It just means Gaelic speakers. It's not this sense of being a uh, separate people. But what's happened then is that there is people in the 20th century thinking about Scottish origins have naturally imported their, and it's our conception as well, of, uh, and the Scots are here just for any people nation, country, uh, in a, in, with a European medieval history, this sense of them as a separate, self-governing, self-sustaining, sovereign entity, all these things, is just taken completely for granted and just telescoped into the, transported into the ninth century. So when they saw this idea of the Scots and Argyll, they thought, well, that's fine. Didn't blink, and then didn't blink when you then, after we get to the 10th century, oh, we've got Scots uh, across the whole country. Therefore, it makes sense, surely, that the Scots have just taken over the Picts. And they will have known, of course, that the contemporary material didn't say that. But when they saw that king list written in Alexander the Second's reign and all these subsequent medieval histories of the beginnings of the Scottish Kingdom, and it 
was speaking in a language that we would understand today and they would understand in the 20th century because it was beginning to talk about Scots in the way we would understand it. It just all made sense and they didn't blink, they didn't think anymore. Right, so the point of this rather long discourse um, is that, um, I mean, I find it fascinating how much of what um, we make sense of, used to make sense of the world we live in, is just taken completely for granted. That is actually its power, is that it is just no questions. I mean, the very beginning of questioning it immediately changes it. So it's these, this framework, these points of reference that are taken completely for granted. So what we're going to try and do today, take a deep breath, is we're going to try and do it differently. We're going to try and not just take our modern sense of Scots, and you could do this for any nation you like, and just tell the story on that basis. Instead, we're going to use the past as a way to peel back the layers and see how we can arrive at an under what kind of understanding we can arrive at, which will reveal a rather different sense of beginnings and origins, one that's actually more about process and development and change rather than just taking something from today and transporting it back as our point of reference. <coughs> And in doing so, oops, in doing so, um, we are going to focus on uh, 1468 to 9, that sort of period, 1266, and eventually the Vikings, if I do not run out of time. I mean, you could say that, uh, and many people do, that uh, actually this is all, however hard we try, it's hopeless, because uh, we shouldn't really be thinking about nations at all, or anything proto-national until the modern era. And it is true that you have to wait until this gentleman here, Johann Gottfried Harder, um, who was active in the late 18th, early 19th century, um, he was the first person who actually articulated a sort of fully formed uh, political philosophy that took this idea of people in an ethnic sense and made it uh, the point of reference for ideas of sovereignty. So our modern idea of people stroke nations as self-contained, sovereign, self-sufficient, distinct, and so on, um, which is deeply embedded, I think, but these things differ if you like, uh, is deeply embedded in the way that so many people think about these things. Um, that is something which indeed is plain to see and articulated um, to the highest level by uh, Johann Gottfried Harder. Nevertheless, what we are doing is using history to get, because there's got to be a background to this. So let's explore it. As I say, we will take our, this is where the Scandinavian bit comes in, is this, it'll be our um, shedding of light on this process. But uh, you'll have noticed that what we're going to have to do is not start at the beginning, as it were, because we've got no idea what that looks like. We can't just import our ideas, etc., back to the ninth century. Instead, we are going to try and pick up the earliest uh, evidence for a really clear sense of Scotland as a sovereign, self-sufficient, distinct kingdom something that we can recognise as, you know, we can see in it at least something of our modern conception of nationhood. And this will lead us uh, to this text, um, which is an Act of Parliament in November 1469. And I'm going to say a bit about this uh, before picking up the obvious point that 1469 is a famous date for, uh, for the Northern Isles. Just to set you a bit of context here, so this is James III, 17, year old, 17 years old, assuming power um, for the first time. And this parliament therefore sees a raft of legislation which is directed at enhancing the quality of justice. So for example, uh, there's a, a fairly bold um, enactment encouraging poor people, this is what it says, poor people, to uh, bring their cases to the king and his council. 
Anyway, this is obviously a bit of a disaster because uh, a few years later um, there's another enactment saying please don't do that, please make sure and go through your baron's court, your sheriff court, wherever the, your, you know, the, the first court should be, uh, most local court, and it's only if that doesn't work that you should, and you can show that it's not working, that you should then bother the king and the council. But it was a great idea to say, please bring your cases, uh, I'm afraid to open the floodgates. So there was a serious, if not very well thought through, attempt to enhance justice. Now, this is another attempt to um, enhance the provision of justice, but it's a little bit trickier to understand. Um, now the phrase up there in bold red is the one that there's been tons written about because it's very striking. It is thought expedient that since our sovereign lord has jurisdiction and free empire within his realm, and he goes on to say that he should be able to appoint notaries. Now, empire there has got nothing to do with having colonies. This is about articulating an absolute claim to sovereignty, at least over secular affairs. So this is the beginnings of this idea of sovereignty really clearly articulated. And they use this term. Now why would they use that term? And why should it crop up in the context of appointing notaries? Now notaries uh, perform a crucial function, as I'm sure many of you aware, uh, because if they produced a document, it represented you know, the most authentic legal writing uh, you could hope to get. And it did so because notaries were, uh, until this point, uh, and this is true across Latin Christendom, notaries were um, appointed by the emperor or the pope, i.e. by those people who, generally in Latin Christendom, were regarded as wielding universal power, so a universal authority. This was the very, very top you could be. So the notary derived their authority from the fact that they were licensed by the emperor or the pope. Therefore, what looks like a fairly mundane business of the king saying, well, I'm going to appoint some notaries now, this is huge, huge significance because, um, and it's particularly the emperor that he's having to go at, so those people who uh, those notaries who have been licensed by the emperor, they've now got to go and be examined again and, and reappointed, basically, um, by royal authority. King James III, therefore, in this act, is assuming the authority of emperor in his own realm. Now that, as an idea, was not brand new. It had been floating around since the 13th century, and, uh, but it's been applied by jurists um, and uh, kind of lawyers and the like, um, and therefore floated around, shall we say, in the lecture halls and might get into some very top-ranking legal briefings. But what we see here is that idea moving out of the classroom legal briefing and into general political discourse. It has moved now into the way that the king himself and the political community are thinking about their authority, and it is a very significant um, moment. Um, however, I'm about to say that people, I think, have been overexcited about it, but you'll continue to be excited by it for a little bit longer, because this wasn't the only um, example of James III being portrayed as an emperor, and um, I'm sure many of you are, are aware of this, that there is this interesting distinction between your common garden crown, the open one, and then your imperial one, which is closed. And of course, any monarch worth their salt these days will have an imperial crown. I say that without having checked it, by the way. So, But next time you look at a crown, have a, see if it's got this um, closed element. And what you find, uh, James III is, is one of the first to do this. It becomes then an increasing trend across the crown heads of Europe. But James III, you see at the beginning, um, well, at the beginning, towards the end of his reign indeed, he's still wearing the open crown in his coins. Oops, back. By the end, <coughs> silver penny, um, can you just make out? He's got the closed crown. And not everybody did it at this time. Um, King of France, a bit later, Louis XII, you think the kings of France would be right up there as first to do this sort of thing. 
Um, but there he is, he hasn't got it. Um, rather striking pose, picture you might say. I mean, the, he, Louis actually, believe it or not, was probably very proud of this because the trend then was to have as true a likeness of yourself as possible. So we'll pause and reflect on that for Louis' sake. <laughs> move on swiftly. Um, and actually, James III's coin at the end of his reign was a bit of a one off. James IV didn't bother thereafter. Um, but the whole thing picks up again under James V, and he goes to the lengths of taking the crown. This is still the crown of Scotland, by the way. It's one of the oldest, is it? Um, so they're taking the existing one and, and then added this at the top to close it, to make it into an imperial crown. So that's what James V did in 1540. And this is what it usually looks like, because of course they put all this padding in, um, probably to make it more comfortable. Uh, so there we are. And you can find it in other ways. And here, I'm sure uh, anybody that's been to King's College Aberdeen will be familiar with this. So, so this is the, the old bit built by the founder of the university, Bishop Elphinstone. Um, and you'll see it's got the same design at the top. So this idea was gaining traction um, in Scotland and elsewhere. And of course, it ultimately leads to a position uh, like you find in England with Henry VIII going the whole hog and claiming absolute power, not just in terms of secular affairs, law, etc., but the church as well, by saying to the Pope that he's no longer head the king now is head of the church, a situation which continues to this day. Now there are other ways, if we return to the legislation of 1469, other ways in which you get a really quite striking sense of Scotland being thought of as this self-contained sovereign entity. And we won't go through this in gory detail, but what it's saying is that, uh, so the sovereign lord's own black money say a little bit more about that in a minute, but this is basically the silver pennies, the basic units of currency, um, and people are banned from bringing in currency from abroad, indeed, on pain of death. Now, um, this is extraordinary because uh, in the medieval economy, it was the silver content that established the value of your currency, so it was absolutely normal to be having all sorts of different you know, it didn't matter whose head was on it, it was the silver that counted. So you have, I mean, you'll get Alexander III pennies turning up, uh, it was late 13th century, in the Baltic, for example. Most of the currency in 13th century Scotland that's in circulation is actually English. And that's not because they're trying to be English, it's just there's an awful lot of it around, it's very convenient, and all that matters is the silver. So this, like, this idea of a national currency is actually very <coughs> radical, it's very strange. Um, and I would be very surprised that it actually was effective at all. I don't know too much about it. You get uh, Scotch coin turning up in the Netherlands uh, in the 1480s, for example. Now, this though reminds us that when we see these statements happening, we should always ask ourselves is there a specific context which is bringing all this to mind? And there is, almost certainly in this case, the coinage has had to be debased so much that the silver content has now been so reduced that it gets called black money because I'm afraid it doesn't look like silver anymore. <laughs> uh, and indeed, it, the silver content has gone down by a half since the 1420s. So this, this sort of low point is around 1470. So that's exactly what we're talking about. So I suspect um, that what's happened here is that there is, there is a crisis, there's a problem, and this is a desperate attempt to solve it. In other words, it's not based on ideology, though it's interesting that they could draw on this vague idea of Scotland as a sovereign, self-sufficient, distinct entity as a way of articulating how to deal with this, but that's not what it's really about. And to be honest, I think the same thing is true of the notaries as well. This idea of the king appointing notaries was to solve a problem. There weren't enough of them, and also the ones who were claiming to be licensed by the emperor, well, their credentials were in doubt. And that really cuts to the core of the legal system, because if you have doubts about the legal veracity of the documents being produced, then that creates all sorts of problems. So again, it's part of this, if there is a bigger project, it's just about enhancing justice 
it's not about the king being really having a program about wanting to assert his sovereignty. That's just there as an idea to be drawn on. Now, um, there are uh, other ways in which we can sort of get a sense at this time of a uh, sense of enhanced sense of Scotland as a united kingdom, which uh, is sovereign, etc. And this is another one, is the establishment of an archdiocese of St Andrews in 2072. And up to this point, remember, the, um, there was no archbishop. Uh, although most of the Scottish Kingdom, not Galloway, not the Western Isles, um, was part of the Scottish Church and a, an independent province uh, within the Black Christendom, um, there was no archbishop. So it was, a, it was a very anomalous position and each bishop had a direct relationship with Rome, at least in theory. And there was a, pro, a provincial council to oversee the, the discipline of the Scottish Church, etc. But, uh, but it was very anomalous, and that was cured, almost entirely cured, in 1472 by establishing an Archdiocese of St Andrews, which took in, it was only at this point that the Diocese of the Isles, uh, which had been under the Archbishop of Trondheim, um, was now part of the Scottish Church, and the same happened with the Diocese of Orkney, so that we can return to. So, what we have here, then is Scotland catching up, if you like, an effort being made to establish a sense of Scottish sovereignty and being a self-contained united uh, entity in a way that we would be familiar with today. The, the final sort of moment for this was 1487 when the Pope recognised St. Anne, the Bishop, Archbishop of Andrews as a primate, so that's absolute top rank ecclesiastic, so therefore the Scottish Kingdom is at the same level as everybody else. Um, and then it all gets more complicated once the Archdiocese of Glasgow is created in 1492, and we don't need to worry about that. Another sign of this um, increasing sense or potential for emphasising Scottish distinctiveness is this extraordinary project, which I'm sure some of you have heard of, the Aberdeen Breviary. So basically this is a service book for use. It's Churches in Scotland that provides readings for Saints' Days. It's the first printed book in Scotland, um, therefore it has royal sanction. But the project is really um, Bishop William Elphinstone of Aberdeen's project. Uh, a lot of research put into it and it's produced. Though uh, I, the people who have studied this um, have revealed that it seems not to have caught, off, caught, caught on at all. Most people just kept on using their existing service books which were full of English saints, etc. So, there wasn't, a, this seems to have been a, something pushed by William Elf, Elphinstone not meeting a general need. Okay, now you might say, what has all this to do then with Scandinavia? Where does this come in? So we will start here with 1468, 1469. Because um, it has been, uh, there's been more than one uh, historian has speculated, uh, no, no stronger than that, speculated, that uh, there is surely a connection between this claim in the Parliament of James in 1469 that he has an empire, that he's putting himself and his kingdom at the level of an empire, claiming this level of sovereignty, and uh, the acquisition of new territory in the, in the shape of the Northern Isles so very recently. And so it has been suggested that this was something which um, was linked in their minds and that this very precocious claim to be an empire, in the sense of absolute sovereignty, is uh, tied with an attempt to assert the cohesion of this newly expanded realm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, this is uh, open to question, and I think what's, what this really emphasises is how these ideas of being sovereign, being empire, etc., are triggered by very specific events. There isn't a sense of an overall programme of national solidarity, enhancing national consciousness, etc. Um, that actually isn't what you see, because you would have thought that had it been so, then there would have been some evidence of a push to um, make the Northern Isles more obviously Scottish, and there's no sign of that whatsoever. Indeed, as I'm sure all of you know, 
Um, and the whole issue of sovereignty was left blank. Uh, what actually happened, uh, and I'm sorry to repeat what I'm sure all of you know um, by heart uh, by now, um, and you may be able to correct me, please do, uh, that uh, the, the King of Scots basically got the royal estates, um, whatever Christian I actually had to give, um, and that uh, Gordon Donaldson's argued that the issue of sovereignty was ducked because Christian wants to deal quickly because he wanted the money, and uh, if sovereignty had been involved, he would have had to go through the process of getting permission from the Council in Norway, and that, well, that would have delayed things at the very least. So rather than bother with all that, they just pressed ahead with the deal. And interestingly, you see, James III, for all that he was proclaiming he was an empire at one moment, emperor at one moment, was, um, he, was he seemed to be relaxed. There's no sign that he was bothered at all by just not saying anything about sovereignty. So that's very striking, I think. And just reinforces the point that this is about these statements not being seen as we might be very tempted to see them as some part of some program. They're not. They're very limited, very specific moments addressing specific problems. Now, um, as uh, I'm sure you're all aware though, the, of course, oh, wait a minute, we'll get that inside. Um, I'm sure you're all aware, this, there was no sense equally that the Northern Isles were not part of the kingdom. The issue of sovereignty was left blank, but uh, the very fact that the Bishopric of Orkney became part of the Archdiocese of St Andrews in 1472 um, is tacit as to light a word for it, a very clear acknowledgement uh, that it was regarded as part of the Scottish Kingdom. I mean to deprive the Archbishop of Trondheim of a diocese is a pretty radical act. Um, so, you know, if, if the King of Denmark and Norway thought this was um, going too far, he would have said so and uh, would have got lots of support. So that all seemed quite fine and uh, you will also be familiar with this uh, as well. So it wasn't just the royal lands that were brought <coughs> into the uh, ownership of the Scottish <coughs> Crown, but also, as a result of this Act 1472, uh, the Earl of Orkney and Lord of i.e. the estates of the Earls of Orkney, equally were annexed to the Crown um, inalienably. And the point to be made here is that there's no suggestion whatsoever in all this that they were going to be like the Earls of Orkney of old and the Kings of Scots were going to be like the Earls of Orkney of old and owe homage, etc., to the King of Denmark and Norway. That wasn't on the cards and never happened. So, de facto, they just let it happen. But what's interesting is that the de jure bit, they were quite relaxed about. Therefore, when we go to this sort of statement, with which so much has been written, that since our sovereign lord has full jurisdiction and free empire within his realm, what I'm suggesting is that we should see this and all the other indications, the things that can so easily be seen by us as part of this very comfortable image, because we're used to it, of thinking of countries as sovereign entities, self-sufficient, etc., etc. Um, we shouldn't do that. We should see that as there's a nexus of ideas in which that is all happening, but it's triggered by something that comes to the surface and becomes something in specific circumstances. Now, there is one area where um, you do get a drive to uniformity, or so it seems, and that is the law. And uh, we'll look at this in a minute. I should have got a slide for this. The earliest indication of this in a Scottish context is 1426. There's an Act of Parliament, um, James I, we're talking about, that all the king's subjects should be governed only under the king's laws and statutes of the realm and not under any particular laws or special privileges nor by the laws of other countries or realms. Now, the particular laws and special privileges, what it's been, it's been pointed out that in the Parliament in 1384, um, the laws of Galloway had been acknowledged, um, and equally, I think, all the law of Clan Macduff. So these are special privileges for um, noble families belonging to the Clan Macduff, whose head was King Robert II at that stage. So um, it's been argued that that's what James I had in mind when he, when he wanted to abolish. Um, what is really interesting, though, is that, um, of course, it's very tempting to read Act of Parliament like that and assume it all happened. But 
um, I just came across um, an act of 1474 which showed that uh, the um, something pretty basic like the procedure for making an arrest was different north of the fourth as against south of the fourth. North of the fourth it was more arbitrary, uh, something to do with touching wands, I'm afraid I don't understand the context entirely, um, whereas south of the fourth witnesses had to be involved. And so it was the south of the fourth method that was now going to be employed. Now this seems pretty fundamental as far as the administration of justice is concerned and it was different in 1474 in fairly central parts of the kingdom. So uh, that makes me wonder whether anything really much came of James's acts of 1426 claiming there should only be the king's law and the common law of Scotland. Equally um, he did set up a commission um, to reform the laws um, and there's no sign that anything like that happened. There isn't a law book that is, you know, th there are things that claim to be law books, Regium Maestatum is the most famous, but it is in so many different varieties and it's basically an, an incomplete <coughs> project that, uh, that it doesn't function as a law code um, in a way that we will see in a moment. But what is also striking is that here we are in 1504 and they're still going on about it. All the sovereign lords as lieges who are under his authority, and in particular all the isles, be governed by our sovereign lords' own laws and the common laws of the realm, and not by any other laws. And what is clear from this and 1426 then is that there is this ideal that there should only be the king's laws <coughs> for the kingdom, for the whole kingdom, but to the, uh, how far are they really going to put this into practice? So they're happy to. to think of it in those terms, but does it really come into practical effect? And Gordon Dawson pointed out that an uh, earlier draft of this same law actually specified Orkney and Shetland, and then that was removed, and he drew the conclusion from this that actually there was a tacit acknowledgement of the fact that the law, of course, was different in Orkney and Shetland. Moreover, they weren't going to do anything about it, um, and he pointed to other evidence for this, the most striking being uh, the law book of Shetland, which he edited, uh, the law book from 1602 um, which uh, there will be people more expert than I uh, that can say more about this, but, uh, but according to Gordon Donaldson, it, it, it is basically the Norwegian law code that's in practice. Okay, you've got some Scottish terminology and Scottish procedures there, but the, the essentials are Norwegian, and that continues until being ab abolished by the Privy Council in 1611. And indeed, there we are, Stellary Castle. So there's Arnold Patrick, famous in these parts, of course. <laughs> um, and so apparently, the last one of the last times the law team of Shetland actually met was in his he moved it, so it was being his castle. And so he was telling me that Arnold Patrick had a problem about personal security. He just couldn't go around the place without a posse guarding him, so that made me realise, well that's probably why he had the law saying in his castle, <laughs> because if he was outside the castle he might have had a rather difficult time. Anyway, there we are. So, so there we are. So I think once we, uh, once we really think about the Northern Isles in terms of what, what this tells us about ideas of sovereignty, James III's actual ideas of sovereignty and how actually very specific they were, not a general idea after all, and also this idea of there being a unified law across the kingdom. There is an idea, no serious attempt to put it into practice very clearly, that being the case in the Northern Lands. The Northern Lands really allows us to understand what's happening in this Scottish context. So, so we do have the beginnings of something we can recognise as Scottish nationality, if you like, in a way that we would readily recognise today, but it is, it is something much, much more diffuse um, and, and not as sort of complete and intense and all the rest of it as, as we would be familiar with today. So a forerunner of that. So okay, let's just then take a step further back and get into 1266 and what do we find? And uh, so here we are, the Treaty of Perth. And uh, this is a remarkable document in, in ways I'm not sure have been fully appreciated. Uh, and there's the bit in red, which is the most striking of all, and it has been much commented on. 
So there we are. So in such a way that all the men of the said islands, which are ceded, resigned and quit claimed to the said Lord King of Scotland, both greater men and lesser, shall be subject to the laws and customs of the Kingdom of Scotland and shall from now on be dealt with and judged according to these laws and customs. Now, what is, um, what is striking about this is that uh, the Kingdom, we are talking about the Kingdom of Man of the Isles. This is, this is not what uh, would normally happen when a king becomes king of another kingdom or dukedom or earl or whatever right, in another jurisdiction. And the Chronicle of Man just puts it very simply. The Kingdom of Man of the Isles was transferred to Alexander, King of Scots. Now what was normal was the King of England situation where he was King of England, Duke of Normandy, Count of Anjou, ruled Gascony, not necessarily all at the same time, but he, he was the ruler, he was the Duke of Normandy when he was in Normandy, he was the King of England when he was in England and so on. There wasn't any sense of making Normandy part of England until you get to Henry VIII, that's another story. Um, so that just didn't occur to people, so that was the normal arrangement. Moreover, uh, ironically, um, there are Scottish cases in the 13th century which shows that was the normal arrangement. Galloway, um, Alan Lord of Galloway dies in 1234, uh, they want to preserve, the Galwegians want to preserve their kingdom, their lordship, um, but Alexander says no, it must be divided amongst heiresses, there's a war, he wins, 1235, he conquers Galloway. Nonetheless, the laws of Galloway, as you recall, continue, whatever they are. There is this, still this sense of there being the laws of Galloway. Um, so Galloway is okay, it's increasingly incorporated within the structure of the kingdom, but its laws remain, it still has a separate identity, um, legally. So, uh, and the most striking example of this actually is a particular favourite of mine, so so-called Treaty of Bergen, Northampton. So this is the situation where they were looking at um, Edward, so Margaret the Maid of Norway, um, was going to marry the future Edward II, and there was going to be a situation, if that all happened, to plan that there would be one monarch for England and Scotland, and the Scottish leaders made damn sure to make sure to, that Edward I would have it in writing that Scotland would function as a completely independent kingdom. Um, which therefore means that Edward I, on the 28th of August 1290, is the first English king to actually explicitly recognise Scottish independence in writing. Well, um, and this is the sort of thing that uh, we don't have to go into, but this is the sort of thing we're talking about. Um, which is, you know, just really thinking it through, maintaining Scottish independence. That is the norm then. So what happens here is uh, that the Kingdom of Ireland the Isles is abolished. It simply doesn't exist anymore. It's completely incorporated. However, we should just step back a bit before we are we really comparing like with like, Galloway, Western Isles, Kingdom of Man of the Isles? Um, given what I was saying about how you know, there was this ideal of there being royal law applied throughout the Scottish Kingdom, but in fact it didn't. Um, so I wonder therefore whether, again, this isn't really worked out in practice, that we're dealing with a situation where there are different ways of thinking about things all happening at the same time. So. Uh, remember, there's no mention of abolishing any existing laws, any separate laws that may have been. There's no sign of any attempt whatsoever by Alexander III and his government to, you know, make, you know, set up sheriffdoms, etc., make, um, bring the Western Isles securely within the uh, administration of justice. Um, it's not until 1293 that there's an attempt to do so, and that, of course, is short-lived because of the Wars of Independence, and we continue with this rather strange business through to 1975, sort of Inverness year, stretching all the way through to Lewis and Russia and down to Harry and all the rest of it. So, um, so it does all look a, a, a little bit odd and incomplete. Um, so, so I think we should just be careful here. I think basically all that's necessarily going on here is that um, the King of Scots has established that his jurisdiction is going to apply. Um, that is to say that um, you know he's the only king around, 
Um, but it, as far as the detail goes of what actually happens uh, in the normal administration of justice in the Western Isles, he's not actually concerned. I mean, this is still a change because in the 12th century, you, a subordinate king would still have complete independence over the running of his own kingdom. The idea of the superior king being involved in the internal workings of, in any sense, of the subordinate kingdom would uh, be unprecedented. Uh, so this is a new development, but it's not the same as the kind of idea of uniformity of law that we find in um, the 15th century, for example. Interestingly, though, um, the, there was a king who did something quite extraordinary in a European context, um, and that was Magnus the Sixth, who, um, as I'm sure many of you will know, um, he's known as the law mender or law giver because he established a legal code for the Kingdom of Norway. And this is uh, the first example of one that was fully implemented of a codification of law for a kingdom that was then applied throughout the kingdom. And he went through it, went, went about it very methodically. So you have the different, I'm sorry for the great map of the mm -hmm. web. You've got your, your four things, arc, um, regions. So you've got your major judicial assemblies. And you go, what's there? It's a touch screen. Oh my God, how do I stop it doing this? Um, put your fingers like that and then bring them in. Yeah, that's right. There. Right. Right, you Okay, so, so they the intention to meet at the same time of year, so you have to go one each year, 474 to 77, to get them to approve. Once they'd done that, though, it was all up and running because he, the, he, the king of Norway, was the source of law from that point on and could make changes, etc. Uh, which means, ironically, that uh, he was closer in practice to being like a Roman emperor than any other king um, at the time. Anyway, and I do wonder, actually, when we think about that, I do wonder when we think about that, whether um, that statement in the Treaty of Perth um, that we'll read here about assuming that the laws should be able to say, okay, this is before the codification of Norwegian law, the national law, in the 40th century. But the ideas, these were the people who were thinking in these terms, not the kings of Scots. And I wonder if this actually, this, this, this is again an idea which we, we would be very attracted to, just pull out of context and treat in general terms. But actually, this might be an example of a way of thinking that was very specific. And it only occurred because once you put the Norwegians together with the Scots, they would start thinking the Scots would start thinking this way, which wasn't natural for them to do. I wonder about that. Um, anyway, we'll, now I will get towards the end, don't worry, the Vikings will get here, we'll get to the Vikings. Um, because, now there's one, this really does mean that there's rather an interesting contrast between what happens in the Kingdom of Norway and what happens in the Kingdom of Scotland. So, in the Kingdom of Norway, you end up in a situation where the king is able to deal with the sort of communities um, in a legal context um, directly. And indeed it has been said that there is, that the aristocracy in the 12th and early 13th centuries, the Norwegian aristocracy, they certainly existed, there was such a thing, but they are invisible in the sources. They're just not that prominent in the context particularly of the administration of justice. This is a big contrast to Scotland. In Scotland, um, as soon as the curtain lifts uh, in the documentary history from the 12th century, it is uh, aristocratic justice, baronial jurisdiction that is the bedrock. Um, so royal authority is mediated through baronial justice. You've got the baronial courts, and then of course you've got people like sheriffs, justiciers, etc., who are themselves major aristocrats. So Alice Taylor's wonderful book, The Shape of the State in Medieval Scotland, 1124-1290, that's uh, it's expensive, but it's absolutely worth every syllable and penny, um, has shown this very clearly. Um, and so that means we are in a different situation. So the, the experience of the administration of justice in Scotland 
is fundamentally different. It is the royal authority is something that the baronial powers will identify with, but as a way of, a, of enhancing their own local control. So, my final question um, then is how does this come about? Well, how does lordship become so prominent in this sphere in a Scottish context? And, um, oh my goodness, right, you're, you're very patient because this is actually quite airy. Um, because as you can imagine, there's very little sources to go by. So all I'm going to try and do is just sketch how we can navigate our way through the development of lordship. Where does this lordship come from that is so prominent in a Scottish context and not in a Norwegian? Um, and, I mean, we find this uh, early on. So, for example, um, as soon as the current lifts in the 12th century, what is revealed is uh, that when, so you've got common obligations, army service, um, bridge work, that sort of thing, if need be, um, and uh, attending judicial assemblies. Uh, these, these things, these, these are sort of basic elements of society in parts of Britain and Europe, and probably Scotland, from the 8th century. Um, they, are, they are levied. The way they are levied is terribly interesting. And the way it's levied in Scotland is through the Lords, and most are getting involved in the royal estates, which happened a lot in some of these provinces, and not so many in others. It is the 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 most important lord, the the, the head of the leading kindred in the province, uh, who actually uh, provides the muscle to levy these common obligations from the population in royal estates. That, that seems to be how it works. So. Um, royal authority is absolutely dependent on and mediated through local power. Now, we want to trace that local power, that development of lordship. Uh, the quickest way to do this uh, is through place names. And so the idea here is that um, we're looking at um, something really fascinating, I find, which is when a word, so a word like bala, means a place, um, a word like Bala and Gaelic becomes a generic element in place names. So it becomes something that is just used as a default for a settlement. Bala as in Balmoral, for example. There are tons and tons of them. You can see there's hundreds of them. Um, and I think that's really interesting, the point where that starts to happen. And the earliest example is actually in, in the late 11th century. In New World Parish of Fife, a place called Balchristi. I mean, it's only the earliest one we know of, but that's the earliest ballad name. So the, these, when we go back to the map, that's, and particularly the East, uh, you know, Gaelic starts, ooh, God, done again. Uh, Gaelic sort of frizzles out in the course of the 13th century. Uh, so all these dots really belong to that time, the, into the, you know, the 12th century and into the 13th. Um, now, what does this mean? And the theory is, is that this signifies an intensification of that relationship between Lord and settlement. Um, we can go into more detail in the pub, perhaps. Um, however, um, and therefore, what we see that that start that intensification starts to be visible from the early 11th century, and it would seem by the end of the 11th century has become the default become so normal that Bala has now become a generic place name element. So that gives us a sense of things happening in the 11th century and intensification, which continues then into the 12th, um, and there by the way is a bit of Bala Christine. Um, now the earlier, so what was the previous relationship between the Lord and the individual settlements? And the earlier relationship, this is the um, case of Newburn Shire, so Paul Christie being part of this, is that you'd have your central settlement, that's the Lord had control over that central settlement, but you had these subsidiary settlements, which simply rendered um, a set amount of produce every year. And this was referred to as cane or coin. Um, and 
When you then moved later on to have this intensification with a ballot name, that coin was then dispensable and could be given to a third party like a church, and that's exactly what happens with Bonnet Christie. Now, we're getting there, because the cane, this idea of subsidiary settlements paying cane, the set amount of pigs, produce, grain, whatever it may be, um, that must have been new at some point as well. And what is really striking about it is that it seems to be associated with pet. So the default, before Bala, the default word for settlement was pet. Now pet, as in pit lochry, pit and taggart, pet is a Pictish word which has been borrowed into Gaelic. You can say more about that later if you like. Um, there are very, very few examples, however, where the second element is uh, looks very like it's Pictish rather than Gaelic. And here's one, Pit Pointy, what it looks like. Um, and so Pointy, the, the pont, it looks like what well, W.J. Watson thought it had pont, which is the Welsh word for a bridge. In it, the fact it's got P in it at all is immediately a signal that we're dealing with Pictish rather than Gaelic. In other words, we are, so let's think about this social change. So again, we've got the same trajectory. You begin to have a new situation where subsidiary settlements are now paying this extra, this cane, uh, to the lord, the lord of the central place and locality. Um, and then that becomes so common, it becomes a default, and the term for this subsidiary settlement paying cane, pet, then sweeps the boards, and you get lots and lots of them. So that's itself an indication of some quite significant social change. We now have to add to that social change language change, because this is happening. This is actually our only real clue about how Pictish disappeared, because we've got, as you saw, Pictish there right at the beginning of the pet naming process, um, and then it becomes Gaelic. So how do we explain this then? Now the um, culprit, of course, the culprit that immediately comes to mind is, of course, the Norse, because they are devastating Picklands, and this comes to a particular height in the 860s and 870s, um, and then, I'm afraid, the chronicle record, the contemporary record, falls silent, the lights go out uh, from the late 870s until uh, I guess it's shine again from 900, and it's always extremely difficult to know what's going on, but um, well, Alex Wolfe has suggested that you actually got them, certainly got them, uh, resident in Scotland for a few years at a time in the 860s and 870s, and that, that then becomes more prominent later on until you have a big battle in 904 uh, when that seems to come to an end. So let's think about this. So you've got these Norse kings, and so they're making themselves at home but in a hostile population, and how are they going to exploit this uh, to best advantage. And, well, one of these kings is actually mentioned as drawing tribute. I mean, that would seem a natural thing, tribute. Uh, so let's imagine them drawing tribute. How can we link all this, though, to pet, and so on? And the key here is Davach. How many of you have heard of the Davach? Oh, nobody. That's I actually... think I've heard this, but I can't remember what it means. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, that's, that's, it is a terrible, oh my God, the amount of stuff that's been written about Davos is frightening. And uh, so you've been spared all that. You can just take it from me. <laughs> like, oh God, I, I do apologise. I have uh, I've abused your hospitality quite dreadfully. Don't worry, we're nearly there. Um, okay, Davos. How are we going to get from Davos to anywhere else? Davos is the Gaelic word for vat. And so there are a number of puzzles about this. Davoch, in a Scottish context, doesn't mean that. Well, maybe it does, but it has a very special meaning. It is the unit of assessment for those common obligations I mentioned before. Army, service, bridge work, etc. And I think the uh, you know, lot of ink that's been spilt about trying to understand all this has uh, been on a false premise, because the false premise is to assume that Gaelic words unit of assessment, and also the fact that they look like they're self-sufficient communities uh, in, in the landscape, 
that all these things should, should be regarded as happening simultaneously, whenever the thing started. Um, and it just doesn't make sense. So the solution is, well, why should we assume it was all simultaneous? And I think it uh, begins to make sense if you don't. So, of course, you've got the self-sufficient communities of the landscape. That's just a fact of life that exists. And then, 8th century, you start getting these common obligations being, um, being drawn from, levied on people. Um, and then that's, uh, well, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to use these existing units, these self-sufficient communities. Um, and there you are. Later, later is when you start getting these things called the Dava. So what is the context that would account for a Gallic word being used in for something that Geoffrey Barrow regarded in the famous phrases? He thought there was something inescapably pictish by the Dava. He could see why, because of where it is. And also, how can the word vat have been used in this context? So we're still not quite there yet. Help is at hand, though, in a poem to an Irish, um, an Irish king. And uh, here we are, swift, fifty swift bats as tribute to that high you know, due from each three coquette that's a much bigger unit than a dam on a series of routes, uh, different ways of translating the last bits are possible. Um, so, the, what? Let's just think about these vats. They are referred to carrying liquid, they're referred to carrying eggs. Um, this is if we're just looking at them being used in the word vat. They are, in short, they are ideal for levying tribute, taking produce and taking it a long distance. And in this poem, he's imagining that everywhere in Ireland is sending a tribute to this king. So, uh, of course, this is all speculation, but I do wonder if we can explain the whole thing by imagining that you've got these um, Norse kings settled in Pickland for a while, drawing tribute, and therefore here we are, drawing tribute from people. The choice is you get devastated when you pay your tribute. So here we are, they're paying their um, tribute. And why then should the word davach be used for the unit of assessment? Because if the unit of assessment was already there. And I think the answer is that when you're thinking about common obligations like defence and the smooth running of society, if you need to repair a road, if it's fallen into disrepair, um, these things are irregular. They only happen when there's a need. Whereas tribute that's dependent on you know, raising local produce, that's an annual event. So it's the regular thing that determined, that, that brought the name in, Davach. And finally, why Gaelic? Well, these Norse kings, um, they had been involved in Ireland for a very long time, more than a generation indeed. Um, the Picts had been involved with Gales one way or another for generations. It's not too much to imagine, I think, that Gaelic is the common language that all these people will have. The, the, if they want to speak to each other, they will do it in Gaelic. So I wonder if, and there could be more to say about this, but I do wonder if, therefore, <coughs> that this is the beginnings of um, that dynamic of lordship that becomes so distinctive in Scotland and limits the potential, if you like, to develop this fully functioning national law code and all the rest of it that we see in a Norwegian context. Anyway, I've abused your hospitality already far too much, so I will draw it to close and thank you very much.